with managerial, what is it, economics, lecture number two, but you had a question. Okay, question. Lecture number one, number one. Yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of like segments oh, two. Okay, okay, so this is going to come. All right, so what was the question? I asked you about the relationship between... The, okay, the relationship between... The price of uh, rising price of oil and gold, rising price in what? In dollars? Yes, in dollars. In dollars. dollars um, and what? Uh, and what? The devaluation of the dollar? Yes. Why is the dollar going down? Okay, why is the dollar going down? What's the relationship? Well, it's shockingly simple. Dollar goes down anything, like anything scarce in a value goes down for one of two reasons. Either the demand falls for it, this is what we're doing in the next chapter, or the supply increases. Of course, demand for the dollar hasn't fallen substantially, well, it has for different reasons, but the main primary reason for a falling dollar is the increase in its supply. We call this inflation. Inflation is the increase in money supply of any particular currency. So the dollar simply falls because the US government prints way too many dollars. Why now, do hmm? why do they do that? They do that because the government benefits from it. If we could have in the basement of this university a nice printing machine where we could print Saudi oh, Riyals yeah. and I can print me a million and you a million and her a million. Wouldn't it be nice? We wouldn't but, be rich. But is it really that simple? Is it a decision that makes yes, to print it is, money? Yes, it is shockingly simple. The reason is that the government spends more than it collects in taxes and there is a fiscal deficit. So when there is a shortage of government funds, meaning a fiscal deficit, the government has three ways to raise the revenue, to cover the shortage. How can the government cover the deficit? Three fundamental ways. To Number one, raise Taxes, number two. Yeah, maybe sell a few things. Yeah, uh, sell like uh, parks and other, you know, sell stuff, sell assets. Well, sell if you have, if you don't have what you do. So, selling assets, what else? Well, of course, one way to is to cut. Spending, cut spending, cut spending. How else? Well, the most standard way historically has been to borrow, borrow. In the last method, which governments always choose first whenever possible, is to print it. Print it. Now, governments, whether it's a king in a kingdom or a democracy, always does which is most acceptable to the populace. In other words, which is most popular. Some measures are very unpopular. Unpopular means the population doesn't like it, resists it, and, if necessary, could make it a revolution, right? Mm -hmm. So, what would be the typical causes of revolutions back in history? Taxes. Of course, taxes. So, raise taxes is always the worst choice. Kings have historically been overthrown for two things. Unsuccessful wars, and meaning a war on the enemy, and the other way is a war on its own people. people. Well, the biggest war you can put on your own people is to tax them more. So, this is always the worst, the most unpopular, and governments never, ever resort to it unless they have no other alternatives. Alright, what about cut, cutting spending? 
turns out to be extremely unpopular. Spending by the government means... People happy. Uh, like yeah, pe 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 people happy, bring in utility for people. Okay, well, here's the economy is always divided in two sectors. The government sector, we call it public sector, and the private sector. So, government spending means that the government spend, it is always a receipt for the private sector. So, cutting <coughs> government spending is equivalent, mathematically equivalent, to lower receipts for the private sector. So, whenever the government cuts spending, somewhere uh, in the private sector, somebody is going to scream bloody murder because the government just took their money. It could be the poor, it could be the rich, it could be whoever. Someone isn't going to get their money and isn't going to be happy about it. Cutting government spending is extremely unpopular. And a lot of things, usually governments will fall whenever they cut the spending of a particular sector. And the particular sector organizes against the government and installs another government that will reinstate the spending. So, what about borrowing? Well, sometimes governments are so reckless in their spending to the point where they can't just borrow because there aren't dumb enough people anymore from the <laughs> private sector to lend them money. Well, if you can't find dumb enough people from the private sector to lend them money, what do you try to do? You try to borrow it from another dumb okay. government, right? <laughs> but sometimes even foreign governments begin to smarten up and realize that Oh no, we can't really lend those because we aren't going to get them back, right? So, then, at any case, printing money is always the easiest, but again, the easiest, how? You gotta say the politically easiest way. So, it is always the easiest course from political point of view. But, what's wrong with printing money? You devalue. you devalue the currency. Well, printing money is equivalent to inflation. Inflation hurts overall everybody in the economy. In other words, everybody pays because the money they hold in their wallet, whether for one day or one hour or one month, falls in value. In other words, inflation is a tax on the holders and recipients of money. Okay, and it is well known, and in every textbook in macroeconomics today, as it was 100 years ago, they simply called it an inflation tax. So, an inflation tax is a tax, indirect tax, imposed on holders of money by the government through printing money and devaluing the value of the current currency, of the existing currency, okay? It's like we get our act together and we print ourselves one billion real. So, ten for me, ten for you, ten for everybody. We suddenly are filthy rich, right? Ten billion is a lot of money still, right? Two, three billion dollars. Well, if we are rich, who's getting poor? Can we just print money and create wealth? Can we become wealthy by printing money? Because, no. Yes. no. For a short period. Print, no, 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 no. Printing money, one million, one billion, one trillion, one quadrillion, can never create wealth. Can never possibly create wealth. If we could get just a little bit richer, why don't we just the print? The prices will go higher, so yeah. it will be like the same. Yes. The rising prices will negate the wealth effect very soon. In other words, it will be a wealth for those who print the money, but those that don't get the money will not be a wealth. It's going to be at their cost, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we print, start printing, you know, 10 billion for me, 10 billion for you, and soon you're going to see in the whole Riyadh prices started moving up for Ferraris, Lamborghinis, whatever you and me consume, right? So, that's what it is. So, printing money is the easy way out for any government to solve its budgetary. We call them 
fiscal problems. So the U.S. government has been consistently printing money. Why would the government print money? What's the problem if the U.S. Well, it has been for 20, 30 years. <coughs> Yes, spending a lot. Okay, what is the U.S. government spending most money on? Which are the two big ticket money? Hmm? Military and what else? So, the military is the one big thing and what's the other big thing? White House. No, no, that's my thing. Social security. Social security. Well, what does this social security mean? How else we call this social security thing in economics? I mean, social security is very popular in Saudi Arabia, right? It's a major policy, but you don't call it social security. How do you call it here? What's the word? Insurance. Insurance. No, it's not insurance. It's a different thing. It's a different thing. It's called welfare. Welfare. So, uh, the U.S. government spends about 80% on two things. The first one we call welfare and the second one we call yes how do we call the military ending in fair warfare warfare all right so the US from again a fiscal point of view, from the point of view of how much money the government spends on specific things, government spends 50% on welfare and 25-30% on, on warfare. So the correct characterization of the U.S. government is that is, or the state is that it is a welfare, warfare state. So it is printing money for welfare and warfare. What, what does it mean welfare, what does it mean war warfare? Welfare means you pay people money to do nothing, right? That's what welfare is, mm -hmm. right? And what is warfare? warfare? What you, you pay people money to kill other people, all right? So, so this is what 80% of the U.S. government spends its money on. It is tiny spending on roads, tiny spending on police, tiny spending on education. Well. What was 100, 150 years the U.S. government spending most of its money on? 150 years, there was no welfare. Welfare was kind of like created in the 30s during the Great Depression. Warfare. Uh, there was no warfare. The U.S. had non internal It was isolationist. Constructing, uh, uh, Constructing things. Actually, uh, yeah. believe it or not, they spent a big chunk of money on courts. Just courts, meaning, uh, uh, but by courts I mean judicial law, right? And they spent a lot of money on police. So back in the old days, the courts we call law, and the police we call force. No force. Order. So the U.S. is a state is a country has moved from a law and order country in, a, in the mid to late 19th century to a welfare warfare state in the mid to late 20th century. The transition happens during Richard, oh sorry, no, that's my mistake, uh, LBJ. LBJ is Lyndon Johnson, president in the 60s, who wants to create the Great society. What does great society mean? Great society means a lot of welfare spending on a lot of people for a lot of things. And what else? What is the late 60s in the United States? There's a war. All right? The Vietnam War. So, the idea for Lyndon Johnson was that America could maintain a great society, meaning can spend on all sorts of social programs, social programs associated with social security or the same as welfare, but at the same time can still keep on its war in Vietnam. So the great society and the same war. So LBJ, the late 60s, were mid to late 60s, were the first year where the U.S. transitions 
big time into a welfare warfare state. When the government tried to finance both welfare and warfare, it didn't have enough funds. So it printed the money, but because it was on a quasi-gold standard called, called Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods means that the U.S. dollar is pegged to the gold at $35 for an ounce of gold. And all other currencies are tied to the dollar. So when you begin to print a lot of money and spend a lot of money, your extra spending will be uh, coming from foreign goods. So you're going to begin to run trade deficits, okay? So suddenly the U.S. became a trade deficit country. In other words, foreigners began to finance the Great Society and the war in Vietnam, all right? So the late 90s and especially now, the last five, six, seven years, the U.S. has begun a massive expansion of government spending. What did it spend money on? Number one, Afghanistan war, Iraq war, potential preparation for Iran, and God knows what other wars. I mean, you got to understand that the U.S. got like 10, 15 little regional wars here and there, but that's a different story. And what else? Is it just wars? Well, you got to understand, after 2001, there has been a U.S. recession. In the recession of 2001, prompted the U.S. government to provide phenomenal fiscal deficits to stimulate the economy. So, expansionary fiscal policy. This is the increasing in government spending when you hold taxes to stimulate the economy resulted in tremendous deficits. And those deficits were financed by mostly printing money and borrowing from abroad. Well, who are the biggest lenders to the United States? Mm -hmm. Who are the biggest lenders? Who is the country with the biggest savings in the world? And lending it to the U.S.? China? No, Europe's not good. Let's give you another half bonus points, right? For a total of two today, correct? Yeah. So, China is the highest saving nation in the world, both in percentages and absolute value. So, the Chinese have the highest saving, and therefore, they're the biggest creditor of the United States. How do we see or understand that the Chinese are actually the biggest creditor to the U.S.? We see by the increasing or rising Chinese reserves. The Chinese reserves in foreign currency, mostly dollars, are rising steadily. So the rate of growth of Chinese reserves, whether in absolute terms or in relative terms, indicate how much they're financing the U.S. government. Who else is big creditor? Another big creditor. The second biggest creditor. No, 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 no. <laughs> they have some. They have some. Because they say they have the growing market. Uh, yeah, okay. Just because a market is growing doesn't mean it's a nation of savers. What it means, save? It means you consume less than you produce. The second nation is Japan. Then the third one is China. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Russia, my mistake. Russia. Another one will be Korea and Taiwan. But number five or four is actually Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, due to rising and high oil prices, King is unable to spend all his money. You know, it's, it's not that easy. It's a... We learned from our mistakes. Oh, oh no, yeah, yeah. Well, it takes it takes it takes a year or two to learn how to spend a lot faster. By the time he learns how to spend a lot faster, oil price has gone up and the surpluses are still higher. Okay. Well, the easiest way and the correct way to spend it fast is two things: pay down as much as possible foreign debt, right? So that Saudi Arabia is not dependent on foreigners and foreign bankers, you know, bankers are typically, you know, uh, once you're dependent on bankers, things usually go wrong down the road. And, of course, the other thing is education. There is no way around education, okay? 
economic growth is always premised on two fundamental things. Of course, a lot of things are necessary for a country and nation to grow, but two things are absolutely necessary and growth has never been observed in history without these two things. One is human capital, we just call it education, and the other one is infrastructure. Infrastructure means from the simple things like roads to electricity to water, in your case it will be water desalination, right, to gas pipelines, to electricity pipelines, to electricity generation, to possibly nuclear electricity generation, to things like internet high-speed connections, including those things, all right? Uh, infrastructure, mobile phones, right? Everyone's got a mobile, maybe two, I don't know. So these are all the important things, education and infrastructure. All right, so we are back to America. So all that rising oil prices and rising gold prices in Saudi Arabia is equivalent to rising oil prices and rising gold prices in dollars and they reflect nothing more and nothing less than the falling value of the dollar and the Saudi real fixed at 375 for a dollar all right so all that it reflects now you're saying well but oil is becoming a little scarcer isn't its price going to be rising more some well, it should be, but relative to gold, okay? If it's getting, getting scarcer, you should be seeing oil gaining up on gold. Well, has it been or not? No. Oil. Yes, of course, it has been. Oil was like $10, $12, depending on when it was, and gold was like $230, $250. So, gold's gone up seven. Oh, sorry three, four times up to 800 or 1,000, three, four times from 250. Oil had gone up from about 10 to 150, that's 15 times. Oil is now $80, it's still up eight times. So oil has been steadily gaining up on gold. This reflects the expectation or the actual relative scarcity of oil to gold. So, you should never get to think those in terms of paper money unless you're sure that the government that prints the money actually doesn't print the money. So, probably one of the better measures to measure the price of oil is always in Japanese yen and possibly in Swiss francs because these are the two most stable paper currencies, paper currencies, right? But the nicer way is always to measure it up against gold. And then you begin to measure everything else up against gold if you want to think correctly. In other words, if you want to have a stable benchmark. Now, is this answering question? You had a question, correct? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, you have a question. If, uh, so you th you're saying if, the, um, let's say, the Saudi real is not linked to the dollar or if they break this link, the oil prices will still be higher, a bit higher in comparison to gold, but not as high as they are right now. Uh, well, uh, okay, now whether, you, you gotta understand this, whether you link or de-link, the relative price, in other words, the price ratio of gold to oil, we just call it gold oil ratio, is not going to change in any way how you link or de-link, you devalue or revalue. And that's the oil the, prices wouldn't go down. If we okay, 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 uh, okay, uh, uh, okay, you cannot say it goes down or goes up. You gotta say it goes down in what? In yen? In gold? In, in... in dollars. Oh, okay, you gotta say it goes down in dollars. Mm -hmm. You gotta understand, you cannot just say the price goes up or the price goes down, okay? Uh, okay, okay, now, now let, 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 let's try the biggest myth ever. Uh, of course, it's government propaganda combined with extreme level of Wall Street incompetence. A global recession will result in falling oil prices. True or false? So they're saying is the world is slowing down. The U.S. is slipping now in, uh, what is it, October 11th, 2008, into a recession, right? You have a Wall Street crisis, yeah. banking crisis, everything. U.S. is slipping into a recession. We more or less know that the Japanese economy most likely slipped in recession last month. 
we already know that Europe has most likely slipped into a recession. We know that the Chinese economy is slowing down. We know that uh, all the Asian economies are terribly vulnerable. So, the whole world is approaching what we would call a global recession. Global recession is what's called bearish for oil. In other words, due to global recession, the price of oil will fall. Why not? Because you said that the oil is to gold, not to... Ah, okay. So, so uh, the correct ways to think is uh, up against gold. Is it true that the price of oil, due to a global recession, is it correct to say that it will fall against gold? No, because it's scared. It's, uh, it's, it's, we, we, yes, but... We won't suddenly like, find like... Uh, uh, more, more oil. Yeah, more oil. I understand. I understand that. The oil okay, okay, so here's the correct way to think about it. As the economy slips into the global economy, because oil is a global commodity, slips into a recession, demand for oil will fall. Of course, if the world grows not by 4%, but instead contracts by 1%, of course, you have an almost linear relationship almost one-to-one -one linear relationship between economic output and consumption of oil. If output falls, consumption of oil and demand for oil will fall. But it doesn't follow that the price of oil will fall because... The supply will be less. They will decrease the supply. Okay, they could possibly decrease. Suppose they don't decrease the supply. Here's the key. When we say the price of oil falls in dollar terms, right? Yeah. We must always assume that the demand for the dollar remains constant. This is a key assumption that is dead wrong. If the global economy falls into recession, and in particular the U.S. falls into recession, demand for dollars will fall. If the global economy contracts, then demand for dollars will fall faster than demand for oil. Okay? And therefore, the price of oil in dollars will rise. In other words, it is true that the true value of oil will fall, but the value of the dollar in a recession will fall even faster. And then the price of oil in dollar terms will continue to rise. Of course, it, will, it, it also implies that the price of gold will rise in dollar terms. And it also implies that the price of gold will rise faster than oil. So when you take the gold-oil ratio for the last six or seven years, in other words, during boom years, the price of oil always gains up on oil. And in bust or recession or weak years, the price of oil, uh, sorry, the, the gold gains up on oil. In other words, they stay long term in balance, but in the short term, two, three, four, five years, they can move from one direction to the other. In other words, you can expect these two to move in fairly wide cycles, and during a boom, the oil to gold ratio will be going up. And during weak economy, it will be going down. Do we have a lot of time left? Five to ten minutes? Yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah. on the on the camera. It's on the camera. Nine, ten minutes. Nine minutes. Okay, nine minutes. Then okay, questions. Well, it's true. Um, the gold is always related to the oil. Whenever the oil is up, the gold is up. True. Uh, no, no, no. Whenever no. no relation. Uh, there is okay. There is a stable, stable long term relationship. You can take a stable relationship for the last 40 or 50 years, for the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and now you can take this gold and it is very stable for decades. But within a decade from 2000 to 2008, the ratio can increase twice. Okay? So it can fluctuate maybe two or three times. So from one it can increase to three and from three to go to one. Well, the ratio is actually fluctuating between eight and 15 or eight and 20. Uh, the way to think about it is one ounce of gold buys 
10 barrels of oil, right? Right? One ounce of gold is now what? $800, $850, and a barrel of oil is roughly $85, and the ratio is 10 to 1. So an ounce of gold buys. So usually an ounce of gold buys anywhere between 6, 8 barrels of oil and 15, 20 barrels of oil. And that's for a very lot. Let's just throw it 100 years, okay? But within 10 years, it will fluctuate. It will fluctuate with the strength in the weakness of the overall global economy, okay? So, uh, is this beginning to clarify and answer your question? Uh, more questions or are we going to get back to the theory of things? Huh? Is this enough? Yes. All right, uh, let's pause and uh, change the...